Good morning and welcome to Mission Control Houston. This group of flight controllers currently on duty is wrapping up another productive week of supporting international space station operations from right here in one of the Johnson Space Center's flight control rooms. Now, in addition to completing their scientific duties this week, the crew on orbit also kept busy by continuing their year of education station activities in a special way and by testing out some old equipment for new purposes. But as always, we have even more to tell you about. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Kayla LaFrance. A tool that once helped guide sailors across vast oceans for centuries is now being put to the test in space. The crew has been testing out a sextant, a device with a small telescope-like sight that could take precise measurements between pairs of stars. These were actually used in the early days of human spaceflight on programs like Gemini and Apollo. And mission planners are once again looking at how they can be used for emergency navigation needs on deep space exploration vehicles like Orion. And as a part of the ongoing year of education on station, astronaut Ricky Arnold caught up with educators in a very special location. The Challenger Center in Washington, D.C. was created by the families of the Challenger STS-51L shuttle crew. Astronaut Ricky Arnold joined teachers gathered there for a special update. As a science teacher, um, I am here wrapping up a year in education on station because of that Challenger mission and because of all the folks involved in the teacher and space program and the people who kept that dream alive. And it's an incredible honor for me to play a really small part in, uh, in bringing this part of the mission to completion. With these lessons now available, be sure to go and check them out. Krista McAuliffe was set to be the first teacher in space and had planned a series of science demonstrations to be shared with classrooms around the world. By using the unique microgravity astronauts experience in space, students can experience a whole new way to see basic science concepts like Newton's law come to life. You can watch the lost lessons or even download instructions on how to do them in your own classroom at challenger.org slash Krista. It's truly heartrending to witness. That's what Expedition 56 flight engineer Oleg Artemyev tweeted this week as he and other crew members flew over the wildfires in California. These are some of the images taken from the station of the largest wildfire in California's recorded history. You can see these photos and others of our planet by following the crew right now on Twitter. Keep sending in your questions using the hashtag space to ground. We'll see you next week. During the year of education on station, NASA has planned many activities designed to expand classroom lessons for earthbound students and teachers. And as you saw, this week featured something extra special. During that exciting downlink event with the Challenger Centers, a video featuring one of Krista McCoff's lost lessons was released. In it, former classroom teacher himself, Ricky Arnold, explores the topic of chromatography. Hi there. My name is Ricky Arnold, and I'm living and working on the International Space Station as a part of Expedition 55. Today we're experimenting with chromatography. Chromatography is a technique for the separation of a mixture into its individual components. Let's go ahead and get started. We have a mixture, this black spot, on a piece of chromatography paper. We want to see what different components of light make up black. Uh, so we'll be putting the water onto this end of the chromatography paper to see how the ink separates. Water is a universal solvent and should help separate the spots into colors. What do you think is going to happen? Talk about it with your classmates. All right, now let's see what happens. Go ahead and add some water. Here's the, uh, the first one. Water is going ahead and creeping up the chromatography paper. You can already start to see no much separation here. Very little on this black one, but you can actually see the reds, greens, and yellows starting to separate and make their way up the chromatography paper. The substances now in liquid form travel over the solid, the paper, at different speeds, causing them to separate into the component parts. Now that we know what black ink separates into, let's think about how the water was able to move through the paper. I put a drop of water in just one spot, but as you can see, it moved along the paper on its own. How does it do that? Well, it happens through a process called capillary action. 
capillary action is when a liquid like water moves upward due to its cohesive and adhesive properties. In other words, water molecules are able to essentially stick together and stick to one another, which is cohesion. And they can also stick to a surface or a container, in this case the paper, in a process called adhesion. And that adhesion pushes it upwards. This happens in microgravity and on Earth. You could try another experiment with chromatography with your parents or your teacher. Grind up some green leaves into a real fine pulp and use some acetone or nail polish remover instead of the water. Leaves are green because they have a chemical called chlorophyll in them, a chemical that can use sunlight to make sugar and oxygen through a process called photosynthesis. However, there are other chemicals in leaves that do the same job, but we just don't see them until fall when the chlorophyll breaks apart. Another way to see fall colors any time of year is to use chromatography. Well, now that we've done this experiment in microgravity, think about how this might look different on Earth. Will the material setup be the same? Will water behave in the same way? Will the same separations happen? Discuss it with a friend, then give it a try. Thanks for participating in our experiment today. I'm Ricky Arnold. We'll see you next time. Expedition 56 crew and most of the crews that inhabited the station before them all arrived there the same way, on board a Soyuz spacecraft. Last week, NASA shed a bit more light on how that will change in the near future. It announced the nine astronauts set to fly on board new spaceships built by NASA's commercial partners and launching once again from the United States. Those astronauts who will form the crews for the first flights on the Boeing Starliner and the SpaceX Crew Dragon had a chance to share their thoughts about their new assignment. I think it's just an incredibly exciting time. You know, I'm filled with uh, excitement, a little bit of nervousness, um, and a lot of pride. A lot of pride in, in what our country has done. It's been a while since we've designed, built, tested, and certified a brand new human-rated spacecraft to go, you know, low Earth orbit and back. So, very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. You know, cargo is, is obviously an important part of getting it, but you know, ultimately space flight is about uh, people. It's an exciting time. Let's go do it. I think if you ask any of us as graduates of a, a test pilot school program, uh, what we wanted to do as the dream job, it would be the part of the development of a new spacecraft. You, you, if you don't feel excited, you're in the wrong job. Uh, you know, we've watched SpaceX come from this company just a short time ago, flying their first rocket to now routinely delivering cargo. And now this is their next step. And uh, it's an exciting place to be. Boeing is a you know a company with a, a rich uh, history uh, in aviation from the very beginning. To be able to contribute to this, uh, to to do our part for the the next generation of uh, space explorers is uh, is just an incredible honor. I'm thinking about all of the people that I've met for the last couple of years that have been putting this spacecraft together, as well as the team at the launch pad who have been getting the launch pad and the emergency egress system ready and all the landing tests and all those people and going, wow, I hope I'm going to make you proud. I feel a little bit like I'm walking in, this, in the uh, footsteps of giants. You know, quite frankly, I think for, for every astronaut, any time we launch uh, humans into space and bring them home safely. That's a historic mission. And so this one just happens to be a little bit different. This is one step on, on the path to returning the ability to launch humans to space uh, to American soil. One of the most important things that we are actually able to work on right now. It's a privilege to be a part of that, by the way. So I, I think the importance of it can't be overstated. We might be the most visible. We're just part of a huge team that it takes in order to make this happen. I don't know exactly what challenges we're going to face, uh, but we're ready for them. And the things that we're going to learn, we don't know yet, but they're going to be incredibly cool.
For some of the astronauts named to the commercial crew missions, that flight will be their first mission in space, just as this expedition to the International Space Station is the first for flight engineer Serena Anyon chancellor But she had a couple of opportunities to practice for such a journey in a spaceflight analog mission, which she feels played a very important role in her preparation for her first time to go to orbit. The astronaut office uses a lot of extreme environments to help us train for the space station. So it's no accident that a lot of us are members on a NEMO mission prior to going to the space station. NEMO, and I, had the, I was fortunate to dive with Luca Parmitano, who had already flown on board the space station at that point. He was our commander for the NEMO mission. During that two to two and a half week mission, underwater. A couple times I asked Luca, is this environment that we live in, is it reminiscent of station? And he said, this is just like living on station. He goes, we have a mission control on ground that we deal with every day, talk to multiple times a day. We have a timeline we need to follow. He's like, even the running sounds of a fan inside the habitat underneath the water, the background noise that's always there, he says, is very much like station. We would do aqua walks or space walks, but we had to don all of our protective gear and do checks, and then we'd be outside the habitat doing dives for three to four hours at a time. So he said this is one of the best environments that he'd ever seen. Antarctica was interesting because Antarctica, I think, is more isolated, much more so than station. So I was there to help collect meteorites, and so I was the lone physician with a bunch of PhDs in geology or lunar geology, Martian geology. I mean, these were all specialists in their field, and it's, you know, Sesame Street. Which one of these is not like the other? That would be me. But funny enough, these folks, all, we all came together, and they taught me, you know, how to find meteorites in the field. You know, when meteorites re-enter the atmosphere and come towards Earth, they form a fusion crust from re-entry. And if you have the sun come over your shoulder at just the right angle, you'll see it glisten right off the surface. And so we would drive our snowmobiles around just using our naked eyeball, no special tools, to find those meteorites. Antarctica, you are very much at that pointy tip of the sphere. And you learn a lot about yourself. You learn what's important when you're kind of in an isolated environment. Things like communication from home, exercise on a daily basis. These are all the things that are parts of good behavioral health uh, during an expedition. So yes, absolutely valuable. I'm Serena Onan Chancellor, and I'm an astronaut. Regardless whether you're in space, like Serena Unknown Chancellor, or on Earth like the rest of us, we all have trillions of microorganisms that live on or inside our bodies. These organisms outnumber cells in the body by at least 5 to 1, and many are essential to human health. Because of that, one study on the International Space Station is looking into how those microorganisms change due to spaceflight, and how that change can affect many of our body's internal systems.
A recent cargo delivery to the International Space Station brought the Multi-Use Variable Gravity Platform, or MVP, which is designed for research involving many different types of organisms and cell types. However, the platform is especially important to fruit fly research, as it will allow researchers to study larger sample sizes than before and support fly colonies for multiple generations. We're looking to answer the question, what is the effect of space flight on the host? The host here being the fruit fly or Drosophila, and also on a pathogen. Uh, so the bacteria actually is one that can infect the fly, very similarly to the way it would infect, for example, a human or any other organism. The genetic makeup of the fruit fly is actually very similar to humans. If you took the human genome and you looked at all the genes that you know are important for function, in that category, in that library of genes, there's 75% similarity between the human genes and the fruit fly genes. In a box this size, thousands of flies can be flown and brought back so that even if you see an important difference that is small, you can get statistically significant data because you get 3,000 flies or 4,000 flies coming back in a box that size. We have a very nice new piece of hardware, the company TechShot. We've been working together with them for the last few years uh, in developing a very capable piece of hardware. What's so special about uh, the TechShot MVP is really that there are two internal carousels inside the unit, and each one of them can produce anywhere from zero to two Gs. So it'll be the only payload of its kind in the U.S. segment that can do this. The sample modules themselves do transport to and from the station in the uh, cargo vehicles, but the, the payload itself, the locker, stays on board the station permanently. We are interested in human exploration. We want to go to Moon, we want to go to Mars, we want to explore the environment outside of low Earth orbit. And to do that, we need the help of these surrogate model organisms because once we understand the genes and the pathways, then we know what the countermeasures are that we're working towards. MVP research is one of many studies on board the International Space Station to benefit long-duration missions in space and to try to ensure successful journeys for those human explorers. Another part of that effort is the investigation into how we can provide a different element that will be essential to deep space exploration, fresh food. To do that, scientists have set their sights on plant growth. Space Gardening Presented by Science at NASA. Roman statesman Marcus Tullius Cicero said, If you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. Humans attempting someday to make Mars their home may well share the sentiments expressed by the orator from ancient Rome. As for the library, books can now be stored digitally. But how does your garden grow in space? To find out, scientists have been studying plant growth on the International Space Station, or ISS. The results could help boost the productivity of both extraterrestrial and earthly gardens. Recently, the ISS has been home to some impressive harvests, yielding tasty snacks for crew members. However, scientists aren't through trying to unlock the secrets of how plants grow away from home. Future space outpost dwellers will need to grow plants for food and for recycling air and water, says Annalisa Paul of the University of Florida. So we're studying how plants adapt to the spaceflight environment. Our findings will also help us understand how plants might respond to new and challenging environments here on Earth. Paul and her colleague Robert Furl have been growing plants in space since 1999 when they launched their first experiment on Space Shuttle Columbia. Several space station experiments followed. One of their most compelling discoveries was that certain root growth strategies assumed to require gravity really don't. Plant roots seek water and nutrients by growing away from where they're planted. To determine which direction to grow, terrestrial plants use gravity as a cue. 
and they used touch to maneuver around obstacles. In the late 1800s, Charles Darwin demonstrated that plants growing along a tilted surface don't send their roots directly away from the seed, but instead send them to the right or left. He hypothesized that this growing pattern, called skewing, was caused by a combination of the roots touching their way across the slanted surface and gravity pulling straight down on them. In an experiment in 2010, Paul and Furl discovered, however, that roots of plants growing in microgravity on the station skewed like their earthly counterparts. The ISS showed us something we never would have known otherwise, notes Paul. Gravity isn't essential in root orientation. Good news. That's one less impediment to growing plants in space. Plants will efficiently seek the nutrients they need without gravity as a cue. The experiment also studied the patterns of genetic expression. Space plants changed the way they expressed their genes in order to produce specific proteins helpful in zero gravity. Paul explains, when living organisms are faced with environmental change, their response almost always involves a change in genetic expression. To cope, they switch on and off certain genes. Plants are pros at this. Paul says, Plants' cell walls undergo a kind of remodeling in space. The genes associated with a cell wall are often in the opposite switch positions than they're in on Earth. The researchers aren't yet sure what purpose this serves, but they intend to find out with additional experiments. Paul and Furl aren't alone. Many other scientists have also been studying plant growth on the space station to unlock the secrets of successfully growing plants in this novel environment. At the heart of all the research is the quest to provide humans with everything they need, wherever they may be. For more about gardening in space, visit www.nasa.gov station. For more on the growth of science both on and off our home planet, visit science.nasa.gov. The effort to feed astronauts in space is, is underway here on the ground, too. With their spatulas at the ready, students from over 30 high schools face off recently at Space Center Houston to find out who could make the best breakfast entree to send to the crew on the International Space Station. Take a look at this action from this fourth annual one-of-a-kind culinary challenge. As we travel farther into space, it isn't just crew health and appetite we have to keep well maintained. Clever solutions to problems like engine part malfunctions and other possible mishaps will be a vital part of NASA's preparations for successful deep space missions. 3D printing is an emerging technology that may be used to create custom mission critical parts. But first, we must understand how particle shape, size distribution, and packing behavior affect that manufacturing process. And one particular study is helping to explore these factors. One of the things they're going to have to do for space exploration is do additive manufacturing because we may have an engine part that fails and you're certainly not going to take up spare engine parts. You're going to have to manufacture them there. And a lot of what we want to do with that means looking at microscopic particles because they're building blocks. And now I think a, a big part of the future in this field and for lots of different reasons is active materials. So now we have ways that instead of just the particles being just particles, we can activate them, we can functionalize them, we can get them to associate with one another specifically 
So one of the things we're aiming for is, is active self-replication, evolution, and microgravity to put lots of things together and to optimize properties using evolutionary processes from not living things, but mimicking what living things have done so successfully. We'll learn how to do that on Earth eventually. But before we do that, it's much better, because they have different densities, to do it in microgravity. It's always really important to do something at the forefront of science that will then become a forefront in, in engineering and production. The International Space Station is a great place for engineering innovations, but it's also home to equipment that could, that could help answer some big questions in modern physics. The Cold Atom Lab facility, or CAL, produces clouds of atoms that are 10 billion times colder than deep space. And thanks to the microgravity environment on the space station, we can observe these atoms for much longer there than we can on the ground. As always, if you'd like another look at the stories we featured here today, plus a whole lot more, you can check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And if you have some time, you should also treat yourself to Houston We Have a Podcast, which features people here at NASA talking about their jobs in all aspects of space exploration. New episodes post on Fridays, so today, August 10th, my colleague Gary Jordan starts a five-part series on the hazards of human spaceflight, and he kicks it off by discussing radiation with NASA scientist Zarina Patel. To check that out, go to www.nasa.gov slash johnson slash hwhap. You can also listen on iTunes, Google Play, and SoundCloud. Until next time, this is Mission Control, Houston.